Well, today we're going to have um, one last look at the main ideas of Putnam's um, meaning and reference. On uh, <laughs> Friday, we'll move on to, excuse me, on Friday we'll move on to uh, Evans's paper, The Causal Theory of Names. Evans's paper is a very, very rich paper. It's really like, more like a book than a paper. Um, every time I read that, I find whole discussions I just never noticed before. So it's good to start early on that and um, try to make room to read it many times. Um, today I'm not really going to do a straight uh, run through the Putnam. The thing we haven't covered in the Putnam is his remarks about division of linguistic labor. But um, I'm, I'm going to leave that as homework, um, what he says about division of linguistic labor. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, and you might agree or not, but it's, uh, what he's saying I think is fairly plain. Um, if not, let me know and uh, uh, we may cover it later. Today what I want to do is take um, a look at how causal theories of reference work for a fairly confusing case, the case of colour. Um, can we regard colour words as a subject to a causal theory of reference? So I'm going to try and break this up quite a bit. But I'll start out with um, uh, looking at, this is, this is not meant to be um, a daunting blizzard of topics. It's just trying to break this confusing subject up into a lot of bite-sized pieces. Um, uh, okay, so let me start out with just the idea of a causal theory of color representation. We've been saying, I mean, we have these theories in the table. You may agree with them or not, but that Proper names represent in virtue of a causal connection to the object. So the object causes you to use the name. And uh, since there's that causal connection between the object and your use of the name, that's how come the sign refers to that thing. That's OK. That's a familiar idea by now. We've heard that before. Yes? OK. OK? Hello? Am I, <laughs> am I in the right class? <laughs> OK. And similarly, uh, uh, for words of natural kinds, so terms like gold, tiger, water, and so on, you might say, well, there's that stuff out there that is causally impacting on all of us. And uh, in response to those causal impacts of the stuff, we use the signs the way we do. And that's how come those signs refer to those stuffs. Um, so how does it go for color? In your color perception, you uh, represent the colors of the objects around you. That's all right. You know, you look around the room, you get all the colors. You're representing the colors of the objects around you. So how general is the causal theory of reference? Do the, colors, do the color representations refer to particular colors in virtue of being caused by those colors out there. Well, here's Locke. Um, Locke, I, 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 for, for those of you who are fans, is really the prototypical causal theorist of representation. Locke clearly thinks that ideas in general represent in virtue of their causal relations to the environment. Uh, he thinks that this is, these things are true for all ideas, but in particular, your color experiences are caused by textures, what he calls textures. So that's microphysical structures in the objects around you. And what's going on in color perception is that the ideas you have of the colors are caused by particular textures. The, the reason um, God gave you a color perception, Locke thinks, is that those sensations you are having are reliable signs of particular physical textures in the world out there. And therefore, um, the color experience stands for the type of texture that typically causes, causes it. Um, I mean, nowadays people would talk about evolution and adaptation, but um, the, a conventional story today would be pretty much like that. It would say, why did evolution give you color perception? Well because those sensations are reliable signs of the presence of particular microphysical structures 
in the physical world outside you. So in this kind of picture, you've got in the one hand uh, light of different wavelengths. This might be pure. This is for pure spectral light. Um, uh, light of different wavelengths, and you've got the visible spectrum of just a little bit of it. And um, those ideas of color that we have are really just responses to light of particular wavelengths. More generally, you might say something like, having a particular color idea is a matter of being sensitive to the ratios of light of different wavelengths being um, reflected from various parts of your uh, surroundings. So the general picture is really similar to Putnam's thing about water, or Kripke's thing about names. You've got a texture out there in the world that causes you to have the idea of redness, and therefore the idea of redness refers to that texture. I mean, it's not quite obvious where the qualitative character comes from in this view. Uh, you've got the qualitative characters of the colors up here, and they're not, how should I say, those qualitative characters of the colors are not out there in the physical world. So it's not quite obvious where they come from, wh wh what's going on with them. Nonetheless, you do have color sensations that have particular qualitative characteristics, and they're representing particular physical textures around you. Something like that is the picture. Um, so you've, you've got, I seem to be going backwards, you've got those, um, <laughs> right, I see. So um, it's not quite obvious how this is going to explain how you could have a representation of the qualitative character of a color. If you see what I mean, I mean the blueness of a blue thing what the intrinsic blueness comes to, because that structure of the wavelengths out there, that's something complex. It doesn't seem to have that simplicity and unity that the qualitative colors have. But anyway, suppose we take this view and we say, could there be twin earth cases for color? And you can make sense of a world where uh, uh, the stuff that fills the rivers and lakes and so on, that's not H2O but XYZ. That's not water. It's something that looks just like water. So could you make sense of the idea of a twin earth for color words? And if you've got a, a, a causal theory of reference for a sign, then the sign refers to whatever's on the other end of the causal chain. So all that's going on in a twin earth case is that you say, well, let's have a world where I get just the same stuff inside my head, inside my mind, but what's on the other end of the causal chain is something different, right? That makes that, that, that's in general what's going on with a twin earth case. So um, we could here have an earth. It could be that in our earth, one kind of surface spectral reflectance, one kind of physical characteristic, is what causes your idea of red. But then in twin earth, it's a quite different physical characteristic of the object that causes the idea of red. So if you're transported to twin earth, then everything's going to look just the same. But the colors will all be different, even though you can't notice a difference. You see what I mean? Just as if we flip you right now, back and forth between earth and twin earth, you're not going to notice any difference in the people around you. You're not going to notice any difference in the uh, water around you. But it's still going to be different. Um, so you could have that with color too. So red on earth is going to be, the word red is going to be standing for something different to what the word red on twin earth stands for. You're not going to notice a difference, but all the colors have swapped around, just as the water has been swapped or the people have been swapped. Okay, so if you have a causal theory of reference for color words, it seems like you must have that kind of twin earth scenario must make sense. You see that it must make sense in a causal theory. Yeah, because, just because if you've got this kind of picture, then you could swap around what the texture is, um, what, what, what the physical characteristic is that you're picking up on. Um, well, one last way to put the point is, um, if you remember this uh, Isaac Besheva Singer story about the man who returns to his own village without realizing that he has, it makes perfect sense for this guy. I mean, you, you sympathize with his plight, right? But um, 
it makes perfect sense for him to say, you look just like my wife, you look just like my friend. He might even remark on the similarity. But for him to say, um, but there's not the same people. And similarly, uh, he can look at the animals in the paddock and say, these look just like horses, but are they horses? So if this is right, then you could do that for colors too. You could say, look, the colors in this village look just like the colors in my home village, but maybe they're all different. Maybe the colors here are just different to the colors back home. I mean, th th this is a, a, a fictional story, but there are clinical patients who um, have a syndrome kind of like this. Uh, I don't mean for the colors particularly, but it's kind of the opposite of deja vu. They come home from the hospital and they say, my God, this is astonishing. It looks exactly like my apartment. This looks exactly like my wife, but it's not. It's palpably not. And they will even comment on, on the, how st stunning, how unexpected the similarity is between this apartment and their own apartment, or this woman and their wife. But they will still insist that they are different. So could you have this for color too? That you have someone who says, look at all the colors here. They look exactly like regular red and blue. They look exactly like ordinary green. But it's obviously not just not the same color. If you've got a causal theory of reference for colors, then that should be possible. OK? That's what you have to be saying if you have a causal theory of reference for colors. Plain enough? I'm just curious, does that sound right? Can you put your hand up if that sounds right? If you think there can be a twin earth for colors? Can you put your hand up if you think that sounds wrong? There can be a twin earth for colors. Um, can you put your hand up if you're not quite clear what the issue is? <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm not noting. <laughs> okay, but you're quite clear what the issue is, but you're just not sure what the answer is. Is it, put your hand over, that's the situation. I see. <laughs> I'm glad to see that GSI's up. <laughs> and in the second situation. <laughs> yeah, right, I see. <laughs> the usual layer of deep suspicion. <laughs> okay. This is some kind of trick, right? <laughs> yes? No, round the other way, on, on, on Earth and Twin Earth. Um, just as on Earth and Twin Earth for water, they say water and we say water. Yeah? Uh, but the, the stuff that their word stands for is different to the stuff that our word stands for. The words mean different things. Yeah? So similarly, on Earth and in Twin Earth, on this scenario, the word red and red are used just the same. I mean, they seem just the same in everyday life. But um, our word stands for one kind of physical structure, and their word stands for a different kind of physical structure. So the words mean different things, even though there's some sense in which everything looks just the same. Yet you wouldn't notice if you were swapped back and forth between there and here. Yep. Yes, yes. That's right. The color perception. There's some sense in which the color perception you have is phenomenologically indistinguishable. You couldn't tell. But, but the stuff out there is uh, different. That's right. The stuff out there is different. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I wrote it down. I think. Yeah. So your idea of red. You're getting the idea in the in the in the two situations, but the thing out there that's causing it is different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that clear? What, is that clear at any rate? What the scenario is, what the issue is. Okay, I, I, I just want to try and get a fix in this question because um, I think this is extremely confusing. Um, I think Russell articulated one idea about colors when he said, "I know the color perfectly and completely when I see it, 
and no further knowledge of it itself is even theoretically possible. And you, you can see what he means there, that um, if you know about red just by looking at it, if, if you, you could learn as much as you liked about red in a theoretical kind of way, but when you look at the color for the first time, you get some kind of knowledge. You get knowledge of which particular color that is. And that kind of knowledge of which particular color it is, you could supplement it by getting knowledge about what kind of wavelengths are associated with it, what kind of plants have it, what its significance is. But how should I say, these are knowledge, that's knowledge of truths about the color. Knowledge of what the color itself is when you encounter it in experience, that, there's some sense in which that's comprehensive. There is nothing more to know about which color red is than you all have just by looking at something red. That's what he's saying. I know the color perfectly and completely when I see it. And no further knowledge of it itself is even theoretically possible. Now, if that picture's right, then you couldn't have a twin earth scenario the way I was describing. Because you, you're authoritative about when you're getting the same color again. When you move from earth, on earth, you know exactly which color it, red is just by looking. Your vision, vision just tells you exactly which color it is. You've got this perfect comprehensive knowledge. So then, over in twin earth, if you're swapped to twin earth, when you look at the colors of the objects around you, then just by looking at them, you have perfect comprehensive knowledge of which colors these are. So of course you can tell authoritatively whether they're the same. You're authoritative about whether there's such a thing as red, and you know when you're getting the same color again. You're not vulnerable to error on this kind of picture. So in Russell's account, um, you're authoritative about whether the colors exist and about whether the colors in one region are the same as the colors in another region. It's not like that for natural kinds. It's not, I mean, we don't commonsensically think it's like that for terms like water or gold or tiger. Nobody in their senses would say, I know the nature of water perfectly and completely when I see it, and no further knowledge of it itself is even theoretically possible. I mean, <laughs> if that was true, if only it were true, but if that were true, then chemistry would of course be a complete waste of, I mean, <laughs> 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 no cheap cracks please, <laughs> chemistry would be a complete waste of time, right? Because that's what the chemists think they're doing. They're finding out about what water or gold or, whatever, or the zoologists think they're finding out about what tigers are. They're getting a better fix than common sense has on what these things are. Um, so none of us usually would think we have perfect and complete knowledge of these chemical substances. Um, you can find out about the structure that's causing your experiences. But in the case of color, Russell's thing is at any rate a little bit intuitive Look, I'll tell you what red is. I mean, you can find out about what a company is red, but red itself I know about, I know completely about already. That's what Russell is saying. But if you have Locke's kind of causal theory view of the way a word like red works, then Locke is saying that colors are really like the way Putnam talks about tigers or water or gold. So Locke on color is very like Putnam and natural kinds. Locke's got the same kind of causal theory. Color perceptions represent the textures of the objects that cause them, and the words for the colors are arbitrarily associated with perceptual signs of colors, so particular color experiences. Um, so of course it's possible to find out more about what color in itself is. Now there's something in this view of Locke, so on this causal theory of words for colors, that you've got to get the qualitative characteristic, the blueness of the blue thing, in somewhere. But in this kind of picture, it's really the color sensation that's got the qualitative character. That qualitative character doesn't seem to be something out there in the world. It's something inside you. So in Locke's view, the colors as, I mean, colors as we ordinarily talk about them are in characteristics of sensations. 
They're characteristics of objects. And in this view, um, color experience doesn't give you any insight into the nature of the colors. Your ordinary experience of water, gold, tigers, and so on, doesn't give you any insight into their natures. It just gives you a, the clue that there is a phenomenon out there to find out about. Um, so that's similar with color, Locke's saying. Um, you don't, it doesn't give you any insight. It just tips you off. There's a phenomenon there that maybe science will one day tell us something more about. Okay? So that's pursuing this line, this causal theory of reference for color terms. Okay? Um, I, I would just like to keep tabs on how you guys are, how striking you guys at this point. Um, well, what is your view? So Rus there's Russell's view, color experience tells you what the colors are. There's Locke's view, color experience gives you no insight into what the colors are. I, I would really like to know a vote. I mean, what's your hunch? Does color experience give you insight into what the colors are? Can you put your hand up if you, if you feel it does? And if you reckon color experience does not give you insight into what the colors are? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah that could, you, you can turn that into a question. Yeah, right. It's a strange question, yes? Yes, right, right. Well, the, no, the, way you're sorry, the way you're describing it is, is a very good analogy for the way Locke is thinking of it, right? So uh, that's, that's exactly an analogy with um, uh, uh, this kind of picture. So here you, have, here you have the pin, here you have the sensation of pin, yeah? Um, you stick the pin in, you get the sensation of pain. Does the sensation of pain give you any insight to the needle? No, right? That's, that's your point. It gives you insight into, into the sensation itself, yeah. But when we talk about the colors, when, when you say that one's orange or that one's brown or whatever, you're talking about a physical object and ascribing colors to it. So we're talking here about colors as characteristics of physical objects, yeah. And um, the idea is that that sensation is not giving you any insight into color as a characteristic of the physical object, yeah. Whether it gives you any insight into the nature of the sensation is, is a further question. In the case of pain, it's really very plausible that when you have a pain, you get some insight into the nature of pain. We'll come on to this in a second, but um, having a color sensation is not like getting a pain because, how should I say it? It's no, really not that the object kind of jabs me. And I'm going, that, that, that sensation again, I'm getting that sensation again. I wonder what's out there. And when you get a pain sensation, you can say, that really hurt. I wonder what's out there. Yeah? When you get color experience, the color experience, I don't, know quite how to, I don't quite know how to put this competently, but the color experience seems to be telling you about what the world's like out there. You see what I mean? It's with a sens pain sensation. Anybody would think it's just giving me information about what's inside my head. A color experience seems to, it seems to be round the other way. It seems to be telling you about what's out there, not about what's inside your head. Yeah, so, but the analogy is a very helpful one, actually. Yeah, one, two. Uh-huh. Do this again. If you're someone congenital, someone born blind, right? Yeah. And you say something about color. Right. They're not going to know. Whether the chair is red. Yes. Just whether or not you're able to perceive it, whereas with the pain, you can't perceive it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This is the causal theory stated, right? So um, the texture out there is causing you to have the idea of redness. So your idea of redness is representing that texture. That's what the color is. Yep. So if that's right, then someone born blind should be able to find out about that texture. They should be able to know what all the colors are. Yeah, so it should be possible for someone born blind to know what redness, greenness, and yellowness all are. Um, because they can find out about those textures. Um, commonsensically, that sounds a little bit peculiar. Yeah, because you would ordinarily think, well, that's the last thing someone born blind is going to know about. Yeah, and Locke has this example of um, uh, one of his learned group who was born blind, who um, said, of course, he could figure out what scarlet was. And after um, some research said, tis like the sound of a trumpet to, you know, great derision. Um, <laughs> that uh, you, you think, well, you can't know what scarlet is. But in this picture, he could perfectly well know what scarlet is. Whereas with pain, um, it's very commonsensical that if you don't have the sensation, well, you don't know what it is. Yeah. Whereas in this causal theory, you could not have the sensation, but still know perfectly well what the phenomenon is. Is, is that, okay. no, that, I think that's a very good way of put, getting at what's... Uh, it, it doesn't sound quite right, <laughs> you see what I mean, about the causal theory. Uh, one, two. Cause it being causally affected yeah. by something and then how you know the joy. Very good, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I'm not sure I have a concise answer yet. Um, there is some connection between causation and knowledge. Uh, we'll, we'll actually discuss this in connection with Evans at uh, uh, more length, but l l let me try and uh, make some brief remarks now. Um, there is some connection between causation and knowledge. Yeah. How about that? Well, <laughs> let me... Let me uh, 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 let me give an, ex uh, an example of the kind philosophers love. Um, um, suppose you have a tomato. A tomato, right? And suppose you have here a mirror. And suppose you have here another tomato. And this is you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not drawing this exactly to scale, you understand. <laughs> but <laughs> this is you looking in the mirror, right? Um, and so light rays, so as is usual in these philosophical examples, you can't see the mirror. I mean, you don't know the mirror is there, right? It's a really good, highly polished mirror. That all right so far? So in the, reflected in the mirror is a tomato, which looks to be at exactly the place where this is, if you see what I mean. Have I lost you? Is that too complex? You see what I mean? So the, the, um, it's not quite to scale, but th this tomato is going to look something like double that distance in this direction. You see what I mean? It's going to look like it's exactly at this place. That's all right? Yeah. OK, so there's a causal chain here from this tomato to your eyes. But there is no causal chain from this tomato to your eyes. Yes? Now. Here, here is the question. Which tomato do you have knowledge of? If we call this one tomato A, and we call this one tomato B, do you have knowledge of tomato A, or do you have knowledge of tomato B, or neither, or both? Yes? Oh, you were voting, or? You vote for B. Anyone else vote for B, or is this an outlier? How many people would vote for B? Uh, this is not a trick. <laughs> There's no need to be so apprehensive. Uh, um, okay, um, how many would vote for A? Nobody would vote for A? No, not a single word for A? Well, of course that's right. I mean, th this is really isn't a trick. I mean, how could you have knowledge of A? Right? But what you're assuming there is that there's a connect between causation and knowledge. 
I said, the only difference I set out in the example between A and B is that there's no causal connection between A and U, and there is a causal connection between B and U. Yeah? So causal connections have something to do with knowledge. The kind of causal connect that you stand into some external phenomenon, like a person or a substance or a color, can be a causal connect that generates knowledge of that thing. Th this needs a lot more discussion, of course, but I just, yeah, this is, this is just to say what the intuitive connect is. Yeah. Yeah, okay, 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 I, 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 I'm, uh, that's an important move, so let me, let's just pause that for a moment. So suppose you say, well, it's, it's the important thing is not knowledge, it's perception. Um, do you see, here are two questions, do you see tomato A? Do you see tomato B? Can you put your hand up if you feel that you see tomato A? You see tomato, <laughs> Let, I, let me not lead you, let me not allow you to persist in error. Tomato A is completely hidden from you by the mirror. Tomato A is behind the mirror, right? If you took tomato A away, you wouldn't even notice. So, on that understanding, <laughs> does anyone wish to persist in saying that you see tomato A? And how about seeing tomato B? Yes, of course you see tomato B. You see tomato B in the mirror, right? Yes? Okay, so even if you say it's perception, well, that's fine, but perception still depends on causation too. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to argue against that in a moment, so let, 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 let me pause that and uh, get, come back to that at the end uh, uh, when we've done that. Yeah. Okay, let, last one. Yeah. yeah. What would be the kind of thing that you could know more about the color? So how does he see that? He can see that there's a color red. Yes. How does he know? How does he know that there's a color by seeing it? How does he know by seeing that there's nothing more to know? How does he know that there's nothing more to know? Yeah, based on observation. Based on observation. Well... So what, what's that knowledge? Yeah. There's no more knowledge. Yeah. The, how should I put this? The, um, suppose you take the case of pain, of an inner sensation, of your headache. Yeah? There's the way the pain feels. Yeah? Is there anything more to know about the pain itself than you are encountering when you have the headache? I, mean, I think it's very intuitive that all there is to the pain is how it's striking you. So you could find out about what's causing it. What helps with the pain? What kind of brain state you're in when you have that kind of pain? But the pain itself, something like Russell's claim, is very intuitive. Yeah, that's all I say. I just say it's very intuitive. Um, when you ask your further question, yes, but how do you know that that's all there is? Yeah. Um, that is a legitimate question, but it doesn't take away how intuitive the claim is, how compelling the claim is, that I know perfectly well what a headache is. But you'd try and tell me, right? Uh, um, if I go to Twin Earth and the doctors there say, well, I know it feels like a headache, um, but actually we've looked at we've done the brain scan. That's not really a headache. That's not what you'd call a headache. Um, it feels like one, but it's not really a headache. There can't be a ringer for a headache. A ringer for a headache is just a headache. You see what I mean? Yeah. So 
That seems very compelling. The question how we know it's, it's, it is right is an interesting one, but it's not being addressed here. You, you, you see what I mean? Um, um, so Russell's idea is uh, when you come to color, it's just like headache. When you know what the redness of the red thing consists in, when you've seen the redness, you know all there is to know about that qualitative character. You couldn't go to Twin Earth and be told, these are ringers for red things. Th th that's his intuition. Yeah. Now, I agree that there's a, it's a legitimate question, how does he know and so on, but to get the comp how compelling what he's saying seems, you, you don't have to go into that kind of meta-theoretical kind of thing. Yeah. I realize you might feel that's evading the question, but I, <laughs> that, <laughs> that's not the, the question you're raising is not at the level at which these guys are arguing. This is here, I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, if you're a bit confused, that shows your understanding. Uh, 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 carry on. Is he, is who? Yeah, is Russell just carving off the sensation? You're carving off the sensation. Yeah, is there really a dispute here? Isn't Russell really talking about the sensation, whereas Locke is talking about the characteristic of the objects? Th th that's your point. Yeah, um, I think that's a perfectly natural way to think of it. Um, and I, actually, I want to come on to this now. So as with uh, your, your question, I, uh, let me speak a little bit further about that and then come back, uh, OK? Because uh, there's a piece I want to get in place before we, we, we discuss this. Um, so, um, so the question is that you guys are, are, are raising is, um, should we think of blueness, um, the qualitative characteristic, as something that has to do with the world out there, or is it something to do with my sensations? Right, that's the issue. And when you think in terms of this diagram, the question is, Take these qualitative characteristics. That's the interesting thing, right? The qualitative character. This is uh, philosophically fairly straightforward, what the physical characteristics are. But what is this qualitative stuff? That's what we want to know about. Is that a characteristic of the object, or is it a characteristic of sensation? Yeah? Um, and on the face of it, <laughs> Excuse me. It seems like Locke and Russell are agreeing. That qualitative stuff is a characteristic of the sensation. And it can't be just the same thing as the physical structure. The blueness has got that kind of simplicity and unity. That the, the physical structure is pretty complex. I mean, that's a very simple representation of the physical structure. But any uh, a unitary color like blue or green or uh, red um, seems to have a kind of unity that the physical structure doesn't have. It's got a kind of simplicity that the physical structure doesn't have. And you could certainly imagine blueness without that, that qualitative characteristic, without any particular physical structure. And your knowledge of what the qualitative characteristic is seems to be more certain than your knowledge of any physical structure. So it seems to kind of lift off from the physical structure. It doesn't seem to be just reducible to the physical structure. So even if you say, well, uh, we're going to have a causal theory of what the word blue stands for, then still there's a sense in which you're going to have to treat blueness as a characteristic of sensation. And that's the point that you were making, yeah? that the blueness of the blue thing. For Locke and Russell, both is going to be there as a characteristic of sensation. Now, actually, I'm just going to blast on a little bit, um, and th th then, I, then I really will pause to, 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 to let you come back. Um, the inverted spectrum. The inverted spectrum? How do we feel about the inverted spectrum? Do, do we all know about the inverted spectrum? The idea that, OK, um, you're looking at the uh, fruit and vegetables in a bowl, and that's the color sensations you get. It's consistent um, with my behaving in just the same way as you, that when I look at the bowl, I get the same sensations as you get when you look at this scene. 
So maybe I don't get the same color sensations as you, but my color sensations might be structured in pretty much the way your color sensations are. Your color space might be mappable onto my color space. Yeah? Uh, so I can make all the same discriminations as you. I associate the same words with each of the fruits as you do. I say, yeah, yeah, that one's yellow, um, and, and, and so on. Um, or rather, I say that one's yellow, even though I'm getting the sensation you get when you look at this one. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the problem of the inverted spectrum, so far as I know, was first stated by Locke in connection with um, violets. There we are. There's some violets. <laughs> now do you understand? Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Locke said, if the idea that a violet produced in one man's mind by his eyes were the same that a marigold produced in another man's, and he means in terms of color. Yeah. So, um, let's see. Uh, can I give you... There you go. Um, so there you go. The, 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 uh, when you look at this, when, when you look at that scene, you are getting the colors that I get when I look at this scene. Yes? You see what I mean? Okay. Um, so if the idea that a violet produced in one man's mind by his eyes were the same that a marigold produced in another man's and vice versa, vice versa. So when you look at this scene, you're getting what I get when I look at this scene. Pretty unhealthy looking marigold, but there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, because one man's mind could not pass into another man's body to perceive what appearances were produced by those organs, neither the ideas hereby nor the names would be at all confounded or any falsehood in either. So you can't get inside my head and really know that I'm getting all that weird stuff, but it just doesn't matter because what's going on here is that um, all the things that have the texture of a violet are producing constantly the idea which I call blue, and all those which are the texture of a marigold producing constantly the idea which I as constantly call yellow. So I give this the same names to the same objects as you do, because after all, all that's going on here is it's the same texture out there that is producing your idea as my idea. It's producing a different idea in you than it does in me. But it doesn't matter because we can use our ideas as signs for one and the same texture. So the two of us are able as regularly to distinguish things for our use by those appearances and understand and signify those distinctions made by the names blue and yellow as if the appearances or ideas in our minds were exactly the same. Yeah? So there's no confusion here, even though the ideas are um, um, uh, so different. But no, so it might be like that as you go around the class. Um, that, right, that, that represents the kind of variation that there is in all our sensations as we all look at the scene in the top left. Um, so that's a way, really, of bringing out that on this view, your color experience doesn't give you any insight into the nature of the properties of the objects at all. Because this one in the top left is not privileged. It's not that any one kind of sensation is giving you some special insight into what's going on out there. All your color sensations are just ways of um, uh, uh, having reliable signs of the physical characteristics of the objects outside you. Um, now, I think that's a very natural way of thinking, and I think that's, uh, I think that's a dominant way of thinking of, of it. I think it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and I want to, this, this is the piece I say I want to have in place. I think it really doesn't work. Um, the trouble is that, suppose I say, if I say to you, look, don't bother about the pin that is causing the pain. Just focus on the pain itself. You could do that. If you say, don't bother thinking about the brain state that is causing the headache, just focus on the headache itself, you could do that. But if I say, consider your current color experience, consider your current color experience of the screen, say, and you say, well, um, don't focus on the external object, 
Just focus on your visual experience itself. Try it now. Can you do that? D -d Don't look at the object. Focus on the color experience, the thing itself. I mean, it, <laughs> it causes a certain amount of eye strain trying to do that, but really, the, the thing is just not possible, right? It makes no sense. If you try to do that, you just wind up staring very intently at the furniture. Um, you, you don't wind up looking inside your head. Um, G.E. Moore first made this kind of point, and he said, the way he put it was, in every sensation there are two distinct terms. Uh, it's best here to think of this as visual experience. Consciousness, in respect to which all sensations are like, and something else in terms of which one uh, sensation differs from another. So that second thing is the object. So the picture is, there's a generic relation of consciousness in which you stand now to the yellow thing or now to the violet thing. So this relation of consciousness is generic and there are the colours out there in the world that you are um, experiencing. Um, and that uh, generic relation of consciousness is very difficult to attend to. When we, attend, when we refer to introspection and try to discover what the sensation of blue is, you try and do that thing, you try and say, well, let me not focus on the external physical thing, let me just focus on the sensation in here. Well, the blue is easy enough to distinguish because that's the characteristic of the object out there that you can focus on. But the relation of consciousness, um, that the, the thing that the sensation of blue is, uh, uh, has in common with the sensation of green, the mental thing, the distinctively mental thing, if you try and do that in visual experience, it's very hard to focus on. And maybe it doesn't even make any sense. If you try and focus on your visual experience itself, but not the objects out there, that's the thing that you just can't do. It, but all you get is these tables and chairs and their colors and shapes. Um, and those are characteristics of the external scene. They're not characteristics of your inner life. In general, that which makes the sensation of blue a mental fact seems to escape us. It seems, if I may use a metaphor, to be transparent. We look through it and we see nothing but the blue. So I think that this talk about color sensations, which comes so naturally, uh, um, not just to you guys, but to practically everyone in this area, it actually doesn't make any sense. Because on the one hand, the color sensations are supposed to be um, things that, well, we have really special insight into, Russell was right about the color sensations, right? That's the idea. Your special insight into the characteristics of your color sensations, that's not something to do with the physical world. But your visual experience doesn't give you any insight into your own sensations. When you try and attend to your visual experience itself, all you attend to are characteristics of the external objects. Um, all we really know about, all we really know how to talk about, are color characteristics of the external objects. And then you say, well, but the objects don't have those characteristics. So I hypothesize that backstage in your brain, there must be some color sensations that are making the thing feel the way it does. Um, but that's just a theoretical postulate. That's just a hypothesis, as you might hypothesize an electron. You postulate these hidden color sensations that are somehow making the whole thing go. But you have no knowledge of them, whatever, any more than you have direct knowledge of electrons. They're just postulated to explain what's going on here. And that's really incoherent. The, the sensations can't be both something that we have immediate, perfect, complete knowledge of and mere theoretical postulates that we don't have any insight into. Okay, I will uh, try and wrap this up briefly at the start next time. And uh, then we'll go into Evans and uh, uh, his short book, The Causal Theory of Names. Okay, thanks. Great questions.